Okay, so um, this lecture is uh, going to be a little bit shorter than the previous one. Uh, that's at least the plan. And it's going to be about the crunch uh, web server. And uh, crunch is to crunch chip data. That is to say, uh, you upload to crunch chipset data and all the processing will be done automatically, yeah. including a finding of all the, the peaks uh, that are significantly enriched and uh, doing a very comprehensive analysis of motif occurrence and binding site occurrence within those peaks. All right, so if you go to the website crunch.unibus.ch, this will be the uh, file that you see. Well, this will be the, uh, what you see. And um, uh, so you can now, uh, you can upload your data. Currently supported organisms are human mouse and uh, Drosophila. All right, so um, there are three ways in which you can provide your data. Either you can upload your FASTQ files directly, use this tab. If you use this tab, you can provide links um, to the um, URLs where um, your files are stored. So you don't have to upload yourself. You just basically tell the server at which web, uh, web addresses your data files are, and then um, Crunch will get the data itself. itself. Or if uh, your data is in the uh, sequence read archive, you can simply provide the IDs of the data sets and then also Crunch will fetch it themselves. So as already came up, <coughs> Crunch would like to get both foreground and background files where foreground files are IP samples and the background files are input DNA. So by clicking on these buttons, you can, uh, uh, you can upload both the IP samples and the input DNA. And uh, this will work similarly with the links where you give separately links to the IP samples and to the uh, background samples. All right. <clears throat> so again, you don't need to set any parameters or something like that. So you just upload your, your data and then you say go. And uh, of course, it's going to take some time. So typically, it's a good idea to provide your email address and a name for your project so that you get automatically notified when uh, the analysis is done. <coughs> and um, the analysis that Crunch will um, perform consists of three steps. So the first step is really the pre-processing, which includes quality, filtering of the reads, removing adapters, mapping the reads and estimating how big the fragments were in your uh, data set that these uh, reads derive from. The second um, part of Crunch's analysis consists of calling the peaks, though, the, and this is, um, this again consists of detecting regions that are enriched in the IP sample along the genome decomposing these regions into individual binding peaks and then annotating the peaks, that is, find out what the nearest associated genes are. The third, uh, and that's maybe the most unique about our pipeline, is we will perform a comprehensive motif analysis on all these binding peaks, which means is that we will both find new binding motifs up in issue. We will uh, of combining these de novo motifs with a library of known motifs, we identify a set of motifs that can together explain uh, your peaks. We will then predict sites for all these motifs and all peaks, and uh, finally score and annotate the motifs. Okay, so I'm gonna now basically explain to you what each of these steps uh, does, and then I will um, illustrate what the results look like. So the first part of the pre-processing that Crunch does 
is to basically truncate low quality three prime interval reads. So sometimes uh, the quality of the sequence comes, becomes bad near the end of the read and basically um, crunch truncates reads to make sure that all the bases are of sufficient quality. And if, there, uh, and if after this truncation, the reads are either too short or there is too low sequence quality along across the entire read, or there are too many ambiguous nucleotides, uh, or if the read it has very low dinucleotide entropy, that is, if it's all a repeat of A or a repeat of uh, AT, 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 then um, these reads will be filtered out. Okay? Second, um, we, Crunch has a library of adapter sequences that are used in sequence protocols, and it will look for matching um, of these three prime adapter sequences to the reads. It will identify the adapter sequence that has most matches, and it will then uh, cut these adapter sequences out of your read. So this is to remove adapters from the reads automatically. After this step, we will do um, read mapping. We use uh, just a standard algorithm to map reads. In, we, we currently use Bowtie to map the reads after we uh, quality filter them. And I think the, the only thing that is sort of um, special in what we do is that uh, we only keep the best mappings for each read. So if, if a read can match with, let's say, one or two errors, we only keep the matches with one error. And if there are multiple mappings at the same quality of a read, we will uniformly distribute the, the read over all its mapping locations. Okay, so if a read maps to 10 places, it will assign to each place with a weight one tenth. Okay, here's just a little picture from a report file that shows what fraction of reads have zero error, one error, two errors as a function of length um, across the read. Okay, so these are all fairly standard steps. It's just that you don't have to worry about these things. Um, Crunch is performing these automatically for you. And then after this, we want to estimate the sizes of the fragments uh, from which these reads derive. So I hear, I took these pictures from a, from a paper of Karshenko uh, in Nature Biotech, some sort of review article, but actually the, the, the idea was published before by uh, uh, Philip Bucher and uh, Christoph Schmidt uh, a year before this. And this is that if you have a protein bound somewhere on the genome, the chipsec, and you get these fragments, so here in red and blue, uh, there are several fragments of DNA that after the sonicating <coughs> of the DNA, you get these fragments. And when you now sequence, you may sequence such a fragment either from uh, the left on the positive strand or from the right on the negative strand. So in red, the positive strand reads that come from this uh, five prime end, oh, so, sorry, this both five prime, but comes from this left end, and here in blue are negative strand reads that come from the other end of the fragment. All right, so now when you have such a protein somewhere on the DNA, then you, so you're gonna get one set of reads that are coming from left ends of fragments and they will make a peak here. And on the opposite strand, you will get one set of reads that makes it, uh, a peak that is shifted on the chromosome. And the shift between these uh, reads on the plus strand and the reads on the negative strand is exactly the average fragment size. Okay, so that means that whenever you have a binding peak, you're actually gonna get two sets, two peaks, one on the plus strand and one on the uh, minus strands that are shifted by fragment length. So you can use this fact to estimate uh, fragment lengths and to basically also estimate the center uh, of each fragment given um, you, a read either on the positive or the negative strand. And the way you do this is by looking at the cross correlation between the occurrence of reads starting on the plus strand and the reads starting on the minus strand shifted by a certain distance. Okay, and then the, the place where this cross correlation is biggest 
is an estimate of the size of the fragments. All right, so Crunch does this. And um, so here's a picture for a data set of what this um, cross correlation profile looks like. And it has here a peak and a fragment size of 137. So Crunch estimates that the fragment size is 137. And then it repeats it, sorry, it replaces every read with a, a mapping to the estimated center of the fragment. All right, so reads on the plus trend get shifted forward, reads on the negative trend get shifted backward. <clears throat> All right. So this was the pre-processing step. Um, the next step of the protocol consists of peak finding. And uh, so this is again a picture that I took from a, from a review article that the general idea is that you slide a window over the genome and in each window, you look at the density of reads coming from the IP sample, and you look at the density of reads coming from IP, sorry, from the input samples. And by looking, uh, and then you find regions that are statistically significantly enriched for reads uh, from the IP sample. That is where the density in the IP sample is statistically significantly higher than in the input sample. All right, so um, what Crunch uh, follows the same protocol, so it slides a window across the genome and then it collects all windows over a significant threshold and it fuses consecutive windows that are all across the, uh, the threshold into enriched regions. Okay, so now one very important um, feature of crunch is that the statistical model we use for uh, detecting and reach regions. So this is what I'm gonna explain to you next. Uh, but before I get to that, um, we've noticed, um, and we're not the only group that has noticed this, that um, there are some regions in the genome, it's a very small fraction, but there is a fraction of regions in the genome that have very high read density, even in the input. Okay, so in principle, in the input DNA, you should get a roughly constant uh, density of read across the genome. And it's also true that uh, more than 99% of the windows in your genome, their read density falls uh, within a narrow range here, somewhere between maybe five and 15 reads per window. However, about one in a thousand of the windows on the genome has a much higher density of, of reads. And um, exactly what causes this is, is a complicated question. We haven't really delved into it in detail, but often these regions are associated with repeats. They are regions that poorly align across genomes. So if you try to find autologous uh, regions in other genomes of those regions, it's, it's hard to do. And we think what is going on is, for example, that there are all these repeats that exist in different copy numbers in different genomes, and the copy numbers that are actually in the assembly might not actually match the true copy numbers of repeats that occur in the genome from which your data derives. And so there might be some repeat that is repeated a thousand times in the genome from which your data derives, but only 50 times in the assembly. And that means that now all the reads from these thousand repeats have to map to these 50 in the assembly. And so now you get a 20 fold enrichment of reads in those regions. So those, these regions are difficult because the statistical model that we're going to use to detect enrichment doesn't apply to those regions. Okay, it breaks down. And so what we do is that we filter these regions out beforehand, okay? So what Crunch does, it detects in your input sample regions that have this very small fraction of regions that have abnormally high density in the input, and these are removed. All right, so now we get actually to the, uh, the crucial part of detecting the peak. So we need a statistical model of how we expect the density of reads in the IP and in the input sample 
to fluctuate. And already a long time ago, um, we worked on this uh, statistical model to describe such sequencing data and fluctuations in the densities of reads. And we first applied this actually to cage data. And what we found is that the fluctuations can be very well described by a statistical model that has multiplicative noise, that is to say a, a log normal fluctuations in density convoluted with Poisson sampling noise due to the sequencing. Okay, so I will not go into the details of the mathematics of why this is a good model. I will just explain you what the, the outcome of it is. So for each window in the genome, we count the number of reads n from the IP sample and little m from the input sample. And we also count the total number of reads in the chip sample and in the input sample, capital N, capital N. So the density in the window in the foreground is little n over big N. And the density in the background or input is little m over capital M. And we're going to define our enrichment quantity x as the log ratio of these two densities. Now, according to this model of multiplicative noise convoluted with Poisson sampling, in regions that are not enriched, so in regions that are, that are where there's no binding occurring, this quantity x should fluctuate in a Gaussian way but where the variance of the Gaussian is given by two times the variance due to this multiplicative noise sigma squared, which we don't know what it is, it might be different for every sample, plus variance coming from the Poisson sampling, and in this log scale, that variance is one over n plus one over m, where little n and little m are just the read counts in this window. Okay, so this model takes into account that the actual noise is different in every window and is a combination of the sampling noise plus the noise due to uh, multiplicative fluctuations. All right, so what Crunch does, it describes now all these read densities ac across the genome by a mixture model where with probability rho, a region is not enriched, so a, a fraction rho of the genome is not enriched, and there the observed value of x, right, so the log ratio of the density in the IP in the background is coming from this distribution, this background distribution, and then a fraction one minus rho of the windows in the genome, they are enriched, and there this this x can be anything. And so we assume that x comes from a uniform distribution that looks just like one over, um, well, how big is the range in x? So x max is the highest x we ever seen. x min is the smallest max we ever seen. And so this uniform distribution is one over x max minus x min. Okay, so that's the model. But now notice there are three variables that are unknown. There is this mean mu. So you might think that the mean of these densities should be the same in the IP as in the background, but it's not really true because in the IP there are actual peaks and they're quite high. And therefore, in the regions where there is no enrichment, uh, the signal, the density will be a little bit less systematically in the IP sample than in the background sample. So mu is this, is this overall shift. Sigma, is the fluctuations in read density. This is actually a measure of how noisy other aspects of the protocol were, like sonication, like PCR amplification, and the sequencing library preparation. Uh, the sigma is a measure of how noisy those processes were. <clears throat> and finally, rho, what is the fraction of the genome that is in the background? And so we fit all these parameters to maximize the likelihood of the data. So we do that for every data set that is submitted. And then once we have done that, we can now calculate for each window, i in the genome, a normalized z-score. And this is the, again, it's the log ratio of the densities in the IP and in the background, minus this shift, oops, 
minus this shift mu, and then divided by the expected sta uh, standard deviation, which is two times this variance of the multiplicative noise, plus the sampling noise coming from both the IP and the background sampling. All right, so now, if the entire genome had no enrichment whatsoever, if there were no binding events, then these Z values should perfectly follow a standard Gaussian distribution. So to show um, what the enrichment genome-wide look like, we make a plot where we show the distribution of these Z scores. And notice that we plotted the distribution on a log scale. That is a Gaussian distribution, which is e to the minus Z squared, turns into a parabola on this log scale. And so in red is the standard Gaussian distribution. And in black is the observed distribution of Z scores along the windows across the genome. And you see that the black line follows very well this perfect Gaussian distribution until you get to a z-score of about four or something. And there you see that there are all of a sudden many more windows with high z-scores than you would expect under this uh, random distribution. And those are in fact the windows that we will now call as having significant enrichment. Okay, so this plot shows two things. First of all, it shows that the statistical model is successful in capturing the distributions of fluctuations that you see genome-wide. And second, it gives you a systematic way of setting a cutoff to call which are the windows in the genome that are really significantly enriched. And so what we in fact do is we can use this mixture model to calculate for each window a posterior distribution that it's truly enriched. And then we basically uh, set a cutoff in Z-score such that the average posterior of all the windows with Z-score at least as high as this cutoff is 0.9. Another way of saying that is to say that the false discovery rate um, is set to 10%. Okay, so by, by definition, we pick the cutoff so that we expect one in 10 of the predicted peaks to be a uh, false discovery. And, and by the way, as far as I'm aware, um, this statistical model is the only statistical model used for, for chipset analysis that actually demonstrably matches the statistics that you see in the data. As far as I know, none of the other approaches actually match the statistics that is observed in the data. Okay, good. So now remember that we've now found these windows along the genome, 500 base pair windows, and we found all the windows that are enriched. And sometimes we, we have that there are overlapping windows because we, we slide this 500 base pair window by 250 base pairs at a time. So you can get overlapping windows that are both enriched and we merge those into enriched regions. And now we want to decompose these, de uh, these enriched regions into individual binding peaks. Now, um, so we also know that because we've estimated the fragment size distribution, we know that if there is a single binding event on the genome, uh, what kind of a width of a peak we expect to see, all right? And so from that, we can take um, the read density that we see in an enriched uh, window and try to decompose it into individual binding peaks. So, so in, here's one example where there is an enriched region that is a thousand base pairs long. Okay, so we had several windows after each other that were all significantly enriched. And now we take this thousand base pair uh, window and we calculate the read density. This is what you see in red as you go along this window. And then we decompose this read density. We model it as a mixture of a constant. A constant. Sorry, yeah. Was there a question? No? Okay. Um, we model this read density across the, the window as a mixture of a uniform background, 
together with a set of Gaussian shaped peaks whose width is constrained by the known width of the fragment size that we have estimated previously. So what you see here in black is the fitted uh, mixture, and that is consistent of a, a uniform background, plus these two Gaussian peaks that are shown in uh, gray dots. And so in the end, we call two peaks in this window uh, consisting of this blue and this green region. And then we recalculate a statistical significance. We recalculate the z-score for the green window and the blue window. All right. So in the end, the peaks that we report are these individual binding peaks, and they're typically fairly short. short. So you see here, uh, they're sort of 80, 85 base pairs wide. All right. So um, the first thing that... Um, Crunch will now report is a sorted list of all the peaks uh, that it's predicted on the genome. Of course, you can, you can download this file and, and print it out. And so for each peak, it gives you the genome coordinates. It gives you the z-score of this peak. It gives you the closest gene to the left of the peak together with where that gene is. So this gene transcription start side of this gene is 124 base pairs to the left of this peak and that gene is transcribed on the minus trend and the nearest gene on the right is this gene it is only its transcription start side is only 40 base pairs away and it's uh, transcribed on the plus trend all right um, all right now, uh, I, I, there's some slides that I thought were there that I do not see now, uh, but in this case too, you can actually click on, um, you can click on this link and then you will see a, um, you will be taken to the genome browser and you will see, um, let me see. Well, I'll, cut, I'll get back to this. All right. Um, the second thing that we show is to give you an idea of the quality of the fitted peaks. We give you one, two, three, four, five, um, six examples of what these read density profiles look like and what the fits to the read density profiles look like. Okay, so here is an example from uh, the top 5% of regions, so that have very strong signal, and then it goes all the way to examples from regions that were still statistically significantly enriched, but that were only marginally enriched. And so you see, for example, also that, you know, these, uh, these profiles get much noisier because the read density gets less as you go from very highly enriched regions to less enriched regions. So you get these pictures to give you a sort of a sense of where in, um, in the range of these peaks, um, what, the, what the quality of these peaks looks like. All right, so um, finally, and uh, probably most important, uh, once Crunch has predicted all these peaks, it will now look for what binding sites occur in the peak sequences that can explain why these peaks uh, were enriched. All right, so the general approach is as follows. Crunch will take the top thousand peaks sequences and it will randomly distribute it into, uh, sorry, randomly divide it in two sets of 500, 500 training peaks and 500 peaks for testing uh, the predicted motifs. All right, so we then, all these peak uh, regions, we will uh, find the orthologous regions in related genomes and make alignments. So for the mammalian, we have a, we make alignments with seven mammals, for the drosophila with, with 10 drosophila. Then we use a motif finding algorithm that we have uh, previously developed, this is now 15 years ago, um, called Philogips, and Philogips will uh, find motifs de novo, and it takes into account not only the sequences, but also conservation patterns. 
Once we found these motifs, we will refine them with another algorithm called Motivo. And this will give us up to 24 candidate de novo motifs. So we will find motifs both with alignments and without alignments and of motifs of different size. And so with this gives us a library of up to 24 candidate motifs that we found de novo on the peak sequences. Second, we have a large library of known motifs from databases. So we have a library with about 2,300 different position-specific weight matrices from resources like Hokomoko, Homer, Unipro, Jasper, our own collection in Swiss Regulon, ENCODE, and HT Selex. And what we now want to do is for a given peak data set, we want to find a set of motifs, which can include both these de novo motifs and known motifs that can jointly explain the binding peaks that we've seen. All right, so what does it mean to explain the binding peaks that we've seen? So to do that, we use a probabilistic model that is a sort of an idealized version of what happens in a chipset experiment. All right, so basically, um, what happens when you do a chipsec experiment is that your amino precipitation fished out a subset of sequences from a much larger set of sequences along the genome. Okay, so we somehow want to calculate the probability that uh, a DIP will fish out all the peak sequences that we've seen, but none of the other sequences that occur in the genome. And so our idealized model of this is that we're going to assume that uh, we have a pool of sequences that consists of our peak sequences in red plus background sequences in black. And these background sequences, we're not gonna take the actual genomic sequences, but what we're going to do is we're gonna make random sequences that have the same length and the same dinucleotide composition as the peak sequences, but that are otherwise random, okay? And it is a big pool of such sequences. And now, given a set of motifs and the concentrations of the transcription factors representing these motifs, you can now calculate the expected number of transcription factors that will be bound to each of these sequences. All right, so as a function of the sequences that occur in, uh, in each of these peak sequences and background sequences, you can calculate how many of the uh, transcription factors that are represented by these binding motifs are expected to bound to each of these sequences. And we will now assume that the probability to IP to fish out one of these sequences is just proportional to how many transcription factors are bound to it. So that's the basic idea. The basic idea is that the probability to fish a particular sequence is just proportional to the total number of sites for these motifs that occur in this sequence. All right, so the probability to, to fish, if you fish out one sequence, that it will be sequence S, is simply the number of sites for the motifs W in S divided by the number of sites for these motifs in all sequences, in all black and red sequences together, okay? That's the probability to fish one specific sequence. And so now the probability to, to fish all the red sequences and nothing else is simply the product of this probability over all the red sequences, okay? So we're calculating the probability of for a given set of motifs to fish out only the peak sequences that we actually saw and nothing else. And what we then try to do is to find a set of uh, motifs W that maximizes this probability, okay? That will be the set of motifs that we say best explains um, the observed peak sequences. <clears throat> 
So uh, for each set of motifs, we can now assign a, 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 an enrichment score. And this enrichment score is defined as um, the probability of fishing all the peak sequences and nothing else, given these motifs, divided by the probability of fishing all the peak sequences and nothing else, assuming that you fish at random, and then this to the power of one over the number of peaks. And this basically gives you how much more likely it is to fish a true peak than a background uh, sequence average over all uh, sequences. And another way you can also look at it is the ratio between the number of sites for the motifs in your sequences divided by the number of sites uh, in background sequences. Okay, so for each um, ChIPSEC data set, um, Crunch will now come back with a set of complementary motifs. And so this is an example data set for um, the transcription factor NRF1. And you see that for this, this complementary set of motifs has four motifs in, in them, and they are given to you sorted by their uh, enrichment. Um, all right, and so for each of these motifs, you are now given a set of statistics that describe how enriched this motif is in your um, sequences. So the first number here is simply the enrichment. That is how much more common are binding sites for this motif in your peak sequences than in similar sequences with similar nucleotide composition, but that are otherwise random. And so you get about 38 fold more occurrences of NRF1 sites or sites with this particular motif than in background sequences. The second number here is an area under the precision recall curve. So basically what you could do is you could try to classify true peak sequences from background sequences simply by the number of binding sites for this motif that occur in the sequences. Okay, so if you use number of binding sites for this motif as a classifier, you will get this precision recall curve that we're shown here, and the area on the, this precision recall curve is almost 93%. So it says this motif is very good in distinguishing peak sequences from background sequences. Third, we will investigate to what extent it is true that higher peaks tend to have more binding sites. So what we do is we take all our peaks and sort them by their Z score. That's a measure of the height of the peak. And we divide them into bins. And then in each bin of peak height, we calculate what is the mean and standard deviation of the number of predicted binding sites. And you see in this case, there's actually quite a good correlation that says as peaks get higher, you tend to also get more binding sites, all right? So this correlation is a Pearson correlation of 0.67, uh, which is really, it's quite a high correlation. It's true for this motif that higher peaks tend to also have more motifs. And then the third thing that you can check is whether the binding sites tend to occur in the center of the, of the peaks or whether they tend to occur outside of the center of the peaks. Notice that if binding sites occur near the center of the peaks, they will occur in those uh, sites in, in the enriched region that have the highest chip signal. So what we look at is the distribution of the chip signal at predicted binding sites relative to the distribution of the chip signal in the entire peaks. And that is here given in green and blue. And you see for this motif, there are nine times, the chip signal is on average nine times higher at binding sites than it is outside of binding sites in the peak, okay? And then finally, we also just tell you what out of all 9,227 peaks, 
almost 4,000 um, had binding sites for NRF1. Okay, so for each motif, you get these kind of uh, information. Um, so um, the way we now uh, create an optimal complementary set of motifs is um, we start with the most highly enriched motif and then we iterate the following procedure. So for each of the remaining motifs, we add this new motif to our motif set and now calculate an enrichment for the new set of motifs, that is our original motif plus now this new motif W prime. And when we select W prime that maximizes this enrichment. Okay, so given that we started with one motif, we now ask for a second motif such that if I sum together the sides of both motifs, I now get uh, the strongest enrichment. And I keep iterating that, adding one motif at a time until this enrichment increases by less than 5%. And so for this particular example, this is the ATF2 data set from um, ENCODE. So the best motif was a, a motif that was found in Novo that had an enrichment of only 1.8. But when you then added a second motif, this is a motif for CREP3, the enrichment went up to 2.75. Another one, it went up to 3.3. And finally, with this fourth motif, it went up to 4.2. So we provide a plot that shows you that as you add more motifs to the set, how does the total enrichment go up? And we also provide for you um, a correlation plot that shows you which of these motifs in the set tend to co-occur or tend to avoid co-occurring. So for example, you see here a red dot uh, between SP4 of Hokomoko and SP1 of Hokomoko, which says that those two motifs tend to co-occur in things. <clears throat> All right. So, um, you can uh, explore yourself what the results of uh, crunch looks like. And um, you can, um, for that, we've made available a large number of results on uh, Chipsec datasets from the ENCO project. So if you go to the start page and you go here to the top left to the ENCO uh, reports link, you will get a page with a long list of data sets. And so these data sets, they're given the name of the transcription factor, the cell line in which the experiment was done, um, the lab that has done the experiment, and a link, um, and links to the actual raw data. And so uh, to illustrate for you the results, I took the results for the BRCA 1A transcription factor done in the GM1287A uh, cell line by the group of uh, Mike Snyder at Stanford. Okay. So the crunch report at the top has basically a menu that allows you to guide to the different parts of the results. So quality control, peaks, motifs, uh, set, top motifs, and downloads. And um, you can use those to navigate. And at the top, um, there is a summary that gives you an overview statistics of the quality of the results for this chipset data set. So it will tell you what fraction of the reads in the IP sample map was successfully mapped. In this case, that's almost 86%. And now comparing across all ENCODE data sets we have, this is about 150 data sets or so, we see that this is quite good. So this is sort of 73rd percentile. This is better than average. Fraction of map, uh, reads from the background samples, input samples that were mapped 89%. Okay, that's 78th percentile. Then next, remember that when we fitted our mixture model for the peaks, all right, there was this, there was this um, quantity sigma that tells you how noisy was the read density as you went along the genome. 
So that was fitted for this data set. And so we next uh, show you uh, what was the noise level um, of this uh, Chipsec signal. And in this case, this noise level was 0.14, which is quite low. It's uh, in the 23rd percentile. So this it, it was a good data set in the sense that the read densities weren't very noisy across the genome. And the second thing that we provide is how well does this, um, once we have fitted the model and transformed the read densities in these regions into the z-scores, how well do the z-follows follow this statistical model? And here, this is also quite good, this sort of 30 percentile. So to give you an idea of what we mean by this, so I already told you that this sigma is the noise in the chip signal. And remember that if the, there was a perfect fit to our statistical model, then all the regions that are not enriched would follow this black parabola. And so I've shown you here a couple of data sets um, where I'm showing you on the right here in these colored dots, what are the uh, um, deviations of the fit. So the best one is, the, uh, is this um, dark green one that has a deviation of about 0.4 and it looks like this. So you see it fits very well, the black curve and only deviates here in the two little rich regions. Then the light green, okay? So this is sort of two thirds of the data sets is at least as good as this light green. And then in yellow and red are two examples of, of the data sets that don't look so good, right? So you see that in some data sets, there seem to be regions that look enriched in the background versus the IP. So they're systematically lower in the IP than in the background. And there are many reasons why this can uh, happen as a, as a matter of a, um, a technical artifact in the experiment. But so this statistic gives you a way by comparing how well this distribution fits this curve, how successful the model was in fitting the read densities that were actually observed across the genome. All right, so that is these. Then for the peak statistics, you get how many peaks you found. So in this case, it was actually really low. All right, it was only 1300 peaks genome wide. This is in the 13th percentile. And we also report what fraction of all reads map to the peaks, which is in this case a 0.4%, which is also quite low. Okay, so there are not many peaks and they're not extremely enriched. And then finally, how successful was the motif enrichment? So the best enriched motif was fivefold enriched, which is sort of average, 56 percentile. And the complementary set, when you take all motifs together in our set, it had an um, enrichment of 10.6, which is also sort of average. All right, so you first get this kind of summary that gives you an idea of how good um, your data set is. You get then uh, information on uh, mapping quality. So it tells you how many reads there were, how many were left after removing low quality reads, how many were left after removal of adapter and low complexity reads, and how many after mapping. So you see you go from 22 and a half million to 19 and a half million, and this is okay. All right, the same here for a second replicate, you went from 30 million to about 26 million. There are also detailed reports and all these things that give you more detailed information, like what kind of errors you saw, whether they were at the five prime, the three prime, and so on and so on. Okay, um, then the report on the, the P calling, it will tell you how many windows along the genome matched, uh, were above this, um, Z value cutoff, so these were about 3,000, but there were a lot of them were overlapping. So when we fuse them into regions, not overlapping regions, we had 1,700 regions. And then we, when we fitted individual binary peaks in these regions, there were 1,348 binary peaks left. Now, this is the distribution of, of Z scores that we found in our windows. This actually fits uh, quite well the um, um, predicted standard Gaussian curve. And so again, the truly enriched regions are over here. Here is the reverse cumulative distribution of z-scores and the red line shows you where we put the column. 
Okay, so here are examples of peaks fitted to these enriched regions, right? So in many cases, you will find only one uh, statistically significant peak, right? So both here and there, we fitted two Gaussian peaks, but one of them was basically not sufficiently uh, significant to make it in the final report. And so in both these cases, only the green peak made it in the end. All right, so list of annotated peaks. Um, I showed you this before, and so let's now go through what the meaning is of all these columns. So first is the location on the genome of the peak. And uh, now I get to see what I wanted to show you. So if you click on this link, you will actually be taken to the genome browser. And notice, right, that this annotation already tells you that uh, to the right, 45 base pairs only to the right is the start of a gene called DEN-R. Whereas on the left, it is 22 kilobases to the nearest gene. Okay, so if you follow this link, you will take it to the genome browser and you will see that the yellow region here is actually the peak region. And because this overlaps a promoter, so here you see a known promoter from a promoter annotation. This is a promoter of the gene then R, and these are the binding sites um, predicted uh, in Cisregulon. Uh, in this promoter. Okay, so the second column is the z-score of this peak, basically how high it is, nearest gene on the left, distance to this gene, nearest gene on the right, and distance to the TSS of that gene, all right? And all this information you get, of course, for all peaks, and uh, they're available in a flat file. <coughs> These were the complementary motifs that were fitted for this BRCA1. So we, we found a set of two, four, six motifs. Um, they're here sorted by the size of their contribution. So this motif was put first. It was a de novo motif that was found new. It had an enrichment of 5.3. When the second motif was added, it went up to 8.5 and so on. Um, so it shows you under this table, you get plots that show you how this enrichment went up as more and more motifs were added. And in the right panel, correlation of the occurrence of these motifs in the same peaks. And you see that for this set of motifs, there's hardly any significant correlation of motifs occurrence. It looks like these motifs are occurring independently of each other. All right, now for each of these motifs, you can click on a link and you will get taken to more information about this motif. The first thing you get is the logo of the motif and the reverse complement of this logo. And then you will get a list. Uh, this is especially useful for new, not known motifs, but motifs that were found de novo. We basically went through our database of known motifs and asked what are the known motifs that are most similar to this motif that we found in our one. All right, so here is this list together with a distance metric. This is basically sort of what, how much percent difference is there between this motif and each of these motifs. So this one is a 3% difference, or this one is 6%, and logos of these motifs. And you see, if you look by eye, then these motifs look indeed very similar to the motif we found. Uh, so we find that this novo, the novo motif is close to a motif that's called G of X in Homer, to a motif that's called UA1 in ENCODE, a motif that's called ZBTB33 in Homer, another motif that's called ZBED1 in HT Silix, and a motif that's called Kaizo in Okomoko. Now I can tell you that it is now known that the transcription factor that binds to this uh, motif is in fact called Kaizo. That's the name of the transcription factor that it binds to this uh, motif. And this UA1 motif of ENCODE is also just a motif for Kaizo. All right, so that's one piece of information you get. Um, and then uh, I already showed you these other statistics about um, the motifs. So you get the precision recall and the correlation of how many, how high is the peak and how many sides for the motif, the 
how much uh, enrichment at binding sites relative to the rest of the peak region and in what number of the peaks does this motif occur. And notice that for almost all these guys, uh, the motif occurs only in sort of half of the peaks. Okay, so this is actually also with quite common that, that often your peak set cannot be explained by a single motif. You really need a set of multiple motif to explain all your peaks. All right, so finally, um, at, the, um, at the end, of the uh, report is a whole set of files for download. So you can download the complete report. So that is all the HTML files with all the links and all the downloadable files. You can download flat files of the peaks. Often you uh, want those. And by the way, this is important that I uh, forgot to mention. So we will also annotate for each peaks where the binding sites occur for each of the motifs in the motif set. All right, so um, um, this complementary motif set consists of six motifs. So we then went with all these motifs through all the binding peaks and annotated where sites occur for each of these motifs. So if you download the peak set, you will get um, also annotations in there of where binding sites occur for each of these transcription factors. All right, so you also can download PDF reports with more details about the statistics of the peak calling and the motif analysis. You also get for each data set that you uploaded a WIC file. So a WIC file is a file that you can upload to a genome browser that gives you the density along the genome and that you can use to yourself now um, look at the peaks we predicted and actually look at the peak profiles yourself in the genome browser. Similar, it also gives you bed files with all the mappings. This is if you just want to have uh, the mappings and also reports on uh, the mapping for each of these references. All right, so I just want to close with uh, a couple of remarks. Um, first, mention some things that we noticed when we were analyzing these ENCODE data sets. So one of the things we noticed is that for some set of, mot of transcription factors, you find only a single motif. And for another set of transcription factors, you really need multiple motifs. Okay, so uh, if you ask how much extra, once I've put the top motif, how much extra information is there now in uh, adding more motifs, there is a whole set of transcription factors where there is essentially no more information that you can add. It seems that the binding peaks are described by just a single motif or a single transcription factor. But this is true for about maybe one third of the data set. For two thirds of the data set, there is either a moderate amount or a large amount of extra information that is contained in other motifs. So it seems that transcription factors sort of naturally separate into some transcription factors that can define peaks all by themselves and transcription factors that are only defined by a whole group of motifs. All right, a second thing that we noticed uh, that we thought is actually quite um, striking, I also, I thought this was actually quite striking, is that um, in these large collections of motifs from different databases, you get many motifs that look very, very, very similar. So I just want to show you here an example of the top five library motifs for the transcription factor max from two different experiments. Okay, so there were experiments done with the max transcription factor in a HeLa cell line, and there were also experiments done, CHIPSEC, in the GM12878 cell line. And I'm just now showing you the top five motifs that Crunch found from the CHIPSEC data in HeLa cells and here from the CHIPSEC data in GM12878 cell lines. Now, if you look at these sequence logos by eye, they all look identical, okay? You see the CAC GTG, Okay, maybe the height of the letters is a tiny bit different, 
but these look very, very similar. And these are indeed uh, motifs from different databases for the max transcription factor. This is from HD Celex, this is from Hokomoko, this is from Swiss Regulon, uh, this is another HD Celex, and this is another one from Swiss, from Swiss Regulon. And even though these motifs look very, very similar, if you let Crunch analyze the data from two different cell lines, they come almost in the exact same order. Okay, so even though they look extremely similar, this HT cell X max motif came out on top in both cases. All right, and uh, here the numbers two and three were flipped, but the numbers four were also in the numbers uh, five. So out of the top uh, four, five sequences, the top four were essentially the same as in both cell lines. So it really looks like uh, you can use this analysis to tell apart subtle differences between these motifs. So we find this kind of consistency uh, across most of the transcription factors that were analyzed in multiple cell lines. Okay, so those were two um, elements and, uh, sorry, those were two observations. And then finally, I want to, uh, close with telling you something about what we're currently doing and hoping to put out uh, soon. So as you've seen, Crunch is a automated pipeline to essentially take one experiment of IP with some transcription factor plus some input DNA and to find basically all the places in the genome where the transcription factor binds and then report for you which motifs occur among these binding peaks, all right? But in many cases, and I, some of you already brought this up in the morning, you're interested in comparing chipset data across different samples. So, so you might have uh, the same transcription factor in different tissues or at different time points in development, or maybe you're not looking at the transcription factor, but you're looking at just chromatin accessibility with a, a DOCSEC or with DNA sec, and you're interested in comparing this across a number of samples. So we've been actually been working on that. So Anna Kramer in my uh, PhD student in my group has been working on integrating Crunch and Mara to do this kind of analysis. So we call this uh, CREMA for cis regulatory element motif activities. So what this approach does is we take all the samples, then we run crunch on each sample to get the binding peaks in each sample. So in this case, there are here three samples shown and you see there's this green peak here in the first sample. There are three peaks in the second orange sample and there are here two peaks in the third sample. And then what we do is we take the union of these peaks from all the samples and we call these cis regulatory elements. So in this case, there are three cis regulatory elements in this region. We then, <clears throat> measure the height of each of these peak across our samples, all right? So the, the, um, the first CRE is highest in the orange sample, the second CRE is, is higher in the orange and the blue, and the third CRE is sort of high in all three, all right? So we, we basically get a height of each of these peaks across all of the samples, and what we then do is we use Motivo with our library of known motifs to predict binding sites in each CRE across the genome. And then finally, we use the MARA model that I told you about in the morning to explain the changes in height or the even absence or presence of these peaks across the different samples in terms of the binding sites that occur in each peak and motif activities, all right? So this is something that is sort of now uh, close to, to, to ready to share. Uh, at the moment, we, you cannot uh, run this yet online, but I'm telling you that this is something that is uh, coming soon, and then you will be uh, able to sort of integrate the crunch and Mara analysis and look at sort of motif activities in driving either accessible chromatin or transcription factor binding genome-wide across a set of samples. All right, so with that, I've come to the end. Um, 
I just wanted to acknowledge the various people that have uh, helped developing this pipeline. I mean, this pipeline, it, it, it took quite a number of years. It was something that we were just running in the lab, in our group for a while. And so there's a whole number of people that contributed parts of the processing. And so, for example, Nick Kelly and Sylvia Salatino, they all, they both contributed scripts to the pre-processing. Uh, Said Omidi helped setting up a, a general pipeline for combining all these things together. Phil Arnold was, uh, he developed the first version of the Peak Finder, and he also um, was the main developer of the Motivo algorithm, so Mikali you already heard about. And then uh, I had a, a extremely talented master student called Severin Berger, uh, who actually then put the whole pipeline together and made this all into an integrated um, system where you can now simply upload your FASTQ files and all this analysis is done automatically. All right, so with that, I've come to the end and I would um, invite you all to um, ask questions if you have questions.